So this was a 92-year-old guy um, who was actually very functional, and, and we see more and more of these elderly people who are very functional. Last week alone, I think we treated a uh, 97 or 98-year-old for a TAVR and saw a 99-year-old uh, yesterday in clinic. Um, again, very independent and uh, functional, but have sort of gotten to the point where their quality of life is significantly inhibited by their valvular disease. And um, these are people we're, we're treating now, uh, primarily because the morbidity and the recovery is uh, much better. Is this showing? It's playing on my screen, but not on the... Anyway, he presented with um, decompensated heart failure and was found to have a flail uh, cord um, with a posterior sort of bileaflet prolapse. Um, was evaluated for surgery, was actually a fairly um, robust and, and would have been a decent surgical candidate, someone who we wouldn't, you know, 10 years ago would not have actually hesitated too much in referring him uh, and, and getting him through an operation. Um, but given that we have alternative technology, specifically the mitral clip, which we'll hear a lot about tomorrow, uh, we decided to bring him in and offer him the, um, uh, a mitral clip procedure. So here you see um, an X-plane. Uh, here's the, uh, his mitral valve. Here's this bit you can see of, of flail uh, and probably some cords if I go back a little further. Uh, and here is his MR jet, which Steve Little will talk a little bit more tomorrow on the challenges of quantifying um, mitral regurgitation and the multimodality uh, techniques we have that sometimes are not always um, in agreement and can be a significant amount of discordance. But here, given his symptoms, um, the appearance of the MR and the, um, the degree of uh, Doppler, we were able to uh, conclude that he would be an ideal candidate for MR. And here you can see it's a little hidden, but it's one of these anterior wall huggers, kind of a Kawanda effect, where there is actually a, a large amount of uh, mitral regurgitation. And when we go and interrogate the pulmonary veins, you see um, systolic flow reversal. So really, he has all the characteristics of severe mitral regurgitation. When we, do the tech, when we do the procedure, as you can see here, it's completely guided by TEE. I mean, there's very little fluoroscopy. We don't give any contrast during these procedures. It's really completely uh, dependent on, on good TEE. And we have to learn to sort of speak the same language, myself and Steve Little is our interventional echocardiographer, who you all know, who, um, along with Nadine, uh, sort of guides us through these cases. And 3D has really, 3D echo has really advanced this. When we started doing mitral clips, um, gosh, 15 years ago when I was a fellow, it was all just 2D guided uh, TEE. And it took hours and hours. Again, the, the device was not quite optimized, but with, with the advent of uh, 3D TEE, you see us routinely doing these procedures from transeptal to closure in uh, less than 30 to 45 minutes. But here's a nice 3D image showing that um, prolapse posterior leaflet. So the idea here is to target uh, an A2, P2 um, clip in order to uh, treat his mitral regurgitation. Um, we use, uh, as well as just 3D uh, uh, anatomy, we use 3D color Doppler to localize and quantify the uh, regurgitant jet. We also use uh, 3D echo now a fair amount to guide our transeptal um, puncture. And so our transeptal puncture in generally needs to be four and a half centimeters above the mitral annular plane. Uh, that gives us enough room to manipulate the catheter, uh, both anterior and posterior, but medial and laterally. If you end up puncturing below that, you sort of get handcuffed and you don't have enough room in order to position uh, the clip and deploy it. So here we measure it right at about four centimeters. Now, if you're treating um, functional MR, which we may start doing more of, we'll talk about that tomorrow, the, the, the uh, height of the puncture is not as important. So here's after a transeptal puncture. This is the delivery sheath. This is the interatrial septum. This is your, your aortic valve would be up here anteriorly. Here's your anterior leaflet, your posterior leaflet. And the delivery catheter is very steerable. Um, you can bring it 
down right to the valve, you have a lot of degrees of freedom moving into anterior and posterior. So here's the clip coming out. There's a few bubbles there just from the, the prep and flushing of the clip. And what we first will do is open it and orient it so that it's perpendicular to the um, plane of the uh, mitral valve. And again, here this is a fairly straightforward one. We're going just for a A2, P2 um, bite. And we're hoping that this will uh, be adequate. So here, in a 2D view, in a long axis, this is where we position the clip when we're, um, when we're ready to uh, close and treat. And you can see it can be a little bit of a challenge to get both the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet uh, onto, um, onto the clip arms. Now, the clip arms are not what actually does the, uh, does the grasping. Um, there are grippers that you can't really see right now because they're in the up position but they're right here along this uh, post. And when we think we have enough leaflet to grab, it's actually these grippers that drop and they, they'll grasp the uh, leaflets and then we'll slowly close the grip arms and bring them up when it's time, uh, time to um, complete the procedure. So here we have gone ahead and done a grasp and we have to make sure of several things. One, we have to be very confident that we have enough anterior and posterior leaflet. And if we don't, um, we end up with a single leaflet detachment, which can be problematic. And we'll see some of that, I think, tomorrow. Uh, Nadine is going to show us a case or two. But once we're confident that we have good anterior and posterior leaflet assessment, we can go ahead and, and release. And we, this is the one time we do use fluoro, where we release the clip to make sure that the uh, mandrel comes out of the device and we have to safely get the uh, delivery system back into the sheath because it has a little bit of a potential spear on the end of it. And then we do our final assessment because there can be some change uh, right before final deployment of the uh, degree of re reduction in the MR. But you can see here we got a, a decent result and I'll sort of jump forward here because in the interest of time. Um, the, uh, one of the other things we interrogate is that we haven't created mitral stenosis, which we didn't hear. And after the release, you see a nice uh, bridge here, tissue bridge, with now we've created double orifice valve. And when we interrogate it with um, color, you see we've significantly reduced uh, the um, degree of mitral regurgitation. Again, there's always a little bit res re residual mitral regurgitation, um, but we've eliminated it here. Uh, almost, but more importantly, what, we, what is more satisfying to me is when we measure left atrial pressure before and after. So the left atrial pressure, for example, in this case was around 50, and after the clip went in, it was, the mean pressure was about 18, so I think a meaningful result.